Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm John Harris. I'm the current vice president of WFO and, and the conference chair. I want to welcome you all to the 2021 uh, Western Field Ornithologist Conference being held for the first time in a virtual format. I think we have a really exciting program for you and it'll contain some of the familiar elements from our in-person conferences like workshops and ID panels and so on, but also a great variety of speakers and, and presentations. Um, I want to acknowledge Jen Hodge, who's acting as tech support and has really been crucial to being able to pull off an event like this. Um, many of you have probably gotten significant help from her already, and she may in fact be helping someone even as I speak. Um, I wanted to make a few reminders. One is that the URL that you received to get into the conference today works for all the presentations and you can use it over and over through the day. Um, secondly, during each speaker, if you have questions, you can put questions into the Q&A um, uh, area. And at the end of a talk, uh, Jen will help us go through as many of the questions that we can get to with the time that we have. Uh, you may also want to pay attention to the chat uh, function, which may have announcements about uh, things having to do with the conference or other events, such as the Birdathon that we have coming up. And I would also urge people to take a look at the Western Field Ornithologist website for information about the Birdathon, um, the results of our recent uh, photo contest, and, and other things. So. I think with that, I'll turn the session over to John Dunn, our current president, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Hello, all. Um, I echo what John has said, but John is, himself has been spending many, many hours working on this, so I thank him. And also Steve Rottenborn, uh, a previous board member for organizing the science sessions. Uh, thank you all, this is our first perhaps our last virtual conference. Uh, we are anticipating Reno finally next year. In introducing Bob Gill, who will be our first speaker. He is a previous board member. He's the editor, now the editor of our special publications and monographs, which is very important. We have several exciting projects uh, well in the works. Uh, and he himself was a co-editor on our third offering in this series of Trends and Traditions, Avifaunal Change in Western North America. As most of you know, Bob is one of the world's experts on shorebirds with voluminous publications that he has authored or co-authored, uh, most famously with concerning godwits and their movements and curlews. But as much as he has published, he has told me that he spends more work and takes greater pride in organizing and giving his talks. I've watched several. I have personally seen no finer public speaker, even in the end, if I'm really depressed as we he details our diminished natural resources. Today we'll be talking about the nesting ecology of surfbirds and the difficulties of studying montane nesting birds. Uh, we, I welcome Bob and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it is, uh, well, an added pleasure to be the first in the first visual conference we have. So uh, like, like you said, I hope it's our last uh, and we all get through this. So with that, what, uh, well, I'm going to start off the conference with a, a science light presentation. Uh, Sorry, I have no hypothesis testing here, no modeling, not even any descriptive statistics to offer. Uh, but I will share a bit of classic descriptive field ornithology. 
based around a poorly known species. Nesting in what to me is the most spectacular setting I've worked in in 45 years of field work in Alaska. My co-authors, Pavel Tomkovich and Maxim Dementiev remain to this day two of my closest friends and colleagues. At the time of this study in the late 1990s, it was a huge deal to get Russians to the US soil to work on uh, collaborative projects. And if you asked uh, anybody in the waiter Shorebird community, uh, who among the Russian ornithologists uh, had the most experience with Arctic nesting shorebirds, there would be no hesitation. People would say Pavel Tomkovich. The added bonus with having, uh, was having uh, Maxim accompany uh, Pavel. Max was one of his students. He, he came with unbelievable interpretive skills for his age, unbelievable artistic skills, and a set of young legs, which uh, after 25 years, I've really come to appreciate. So if you, you want to learn more about the tattler aspect, because it's, I think the abstract still says tattlers uh, and other montane species, you can turn to these uh, titles. They all came out of this study at Turquoise Lake. Uh, as will the surfbird study, uh, hopefully this year. Okay, why so little known about surfbirds? I mean, there's several obvious uh, alpine habitats, whether it's high Arctic and at sea level or montane, they're just hard to access. Uh, montane species, extremely low densities. They have very specialized nesting behaviors, which we'll see more about. And this particular one, the surf birds, has the uh, wintering distribution that just occurs along high energy ocean shores, also hard to get at. And to do study any aspect of this, it just almost requires Olympic uh, scale training just to get in shape. So our study came about really just three things sort of converged. Uh, Alan Bennett sitting here working for the National Park Service uh, in Lake Clark Park uh, had discovered what he thought was a workable population of surfbirds. Then shortly that later that year, the BNA came out identifying major information gaps. And we fortuitously secured funding to uh, go to Lake Clark and hopefully fill in some of these gaps. The BNA cemented our resolve to learn more about surfbirds. Uh, just within the section on breeding ecology, within the account, the, the phrase no information is mentioned 22 of the 34 topics covered under breeding. Surfbirds uh, at one time were out on their own uh, branch of the shorebird genetic tree. They've now been uh, merged with uh, great knots and red knots into a specific uh, three species clade. All have similar plumage, behaviors, and breeding biology. They're all, all the three distributions were shaped by uh, Pleistocene glaciation and glacial refugia. You can see red knots are circumpolar, I think in five or six uh, species, subspecies. The great knot uh, range shown here is a little more uh, fragmented than uh, depicted, but is restricted to Chukotka. And surfbirds uh, fragmented right now, as we understand it, I think we can do better there yep, with what the information we've had since the BNA came out. The non-breeding range uh, is of uh, surfbirds is the longest of any of the world shorebirds. It extends uh, 60 north to 67 south, 18,000 kilometers of coastline, 
encompassing 14 countries and the current estimate is about 70,000 birds. Uh, they tend to uh, occupy this high energy wave and it's, uh, if you're looking to see how many birds there are in this picture, voila, uh, they do blend in. Just a, briefly, the annual cycle uh, essentially forms around two habitats, rocky intertidal, high energy uh, coastlines, and alpine tundra. And I'll start this here with staging birds in Prince William Sound, Alaska in May. They go to breeding tundra, typical uh, tundra nesting shorebirds in dwarf shrub habitat, very cryptic. Chicks even more cryptic. Juveniles also very cryptic. And then once juveniles fledge, uh, they merge with adults in winter plumage and work their way to Prince William Sound the following year. The uh, principal spring staging grounds for the entire population is Prince William Sound. And it's located anywhere from 100 to 300 kilometers away from uh, prime breeding habitat. And I want to just call your attention to Turquoise Lake and Turquoise here, because that's the study area. We're gonna see a lot more about it. Just to give you another setting, uh, this is not from the view of a surf bird because this image is about 45,000 feet, but it shows you the proximity of these glacially formed lakes, the Alaska Range, Cook Inlet, Gulf of Alaska, and there's Anchorage pretty much due east of Turquoise Lake. Go over a few images of the setting. Uh, this is looking east uh, towards Anchorage. And I call your attention to the orange dot right here because this is looking from the orange dot to the west, out to the uh, mouth of uh, the Milchatten River, the end of Turquoise Lake. When we arrived here, we really had no idea of how big of an area we needed to address to find a workable population of surf birds. It ended up being quite huge. You can see dimensions here. Uh, the lake is two and a half kilometers wide, eight kilometers long. Um, the peaks uh, in the back are 2,000 to 2,500 meters and the slopes uh, you see here the north and south study slopes extend upward from the lake plateau another 250 to 500 meters above lake level. Now we'll look at uh, a bit about the actual nesting habitat of surf birds focusing here on the south study slope. Uh, and I'll just call your attention to this line you see here going across the oval. Surf birds are, are, at least in this lake, and I suspect, well, I know on the lakes to the uh, west, I'm not sure about the east, um, all of these lakes are formed by retreating glaciers, and in doing so, the retreat leaves these lateral moraines, which uh, you can see here, they're just sort of a stair-step fashion with a terrace, a steep slope, terrace, terrace, slope. And it's on these that uh, surf birds are nesting on the terrace parts or at the toe slopes. We've got a picture of Pavel sitting here glassing the area, but he's sitting on one of the terraces and you can follow the edge of it on around it goes down and this one actually extends this way. So you get a, a visual of these stair step fashion here and it's in these depressions here, slope is where surf birds are nesting, particularly among black lichen habitat.
getting to these terraces was a, a daily challenge. Uh, steep, much steeper than depicted in the previous pictures. And it involved a lot and a lot and a lot of hiking. These are round trip distances from camp to various parts of the study area. Um, we uh, obviously had to divide and conquer to uh, cover these areas. Uh, and I'll just mention the, the Tatler study, which occurred concurrently with this. These areas extended another eight to 10 kilometers downstream is where most of the tattlers were nesting. This is what we saw upon arrival. This is what surfbirds see upon arrival. Probably 50% snow cover here. The lake is still frozen, except for the, the outfall where there is pooled water. It's a fickle time of year and winter doesn't always make a clean transition in the spring. We get uh, periodic snowstorms um, that will last a day or two. Birds, uh, you know, these things can come anytime between May and even into late June and it catches a lot of birds on the nest. This would have been an easy way to find nests if you could have gotten through all the snow to get there, but uh, more on that later. Even after uh, snows are pretty much gone, uh, you get a lot of unsettled air over the Alaska range. And uh, this is, depicts a, a hailstorm we had one day that essentially turned the landscape back into winter. This was during uh, peak nesting. And the birds just sat through it. A uh, little bit draggled, but they made it. We had to deal with other things. Uh, the study area sits between the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, which are two of the two global weather factories uh, on this planet. And when one is uh, out of juxtaposed with the other, in other words, high or low pressure, you get tremendous winds coming through these small little mountain passes. This one, uh, you know, that's category, uh, hurricane category two and three winds, uh, which are not uncommon in Alaska. You just don't hear that much about them. All right, well, what about surfbirds? Uh, you've seen where they reside. Let's see what they do there. You start any study, uh, you know, it's nice to have a marked population of birds so you can uh, make sense of what's going on. And we spent a lot of time looking that first year and three trained observers produced one nest during uh, the entire laying incubation period. Part of the reason why is their, their nesting behavior. They, ex, they sit extremely tight. Here, Pavel has a handle of a insect net resting on the back of an incubating surfbird that just would not get off the nest. Uh, so in other words, if you're walking, well, in this case, you walk right over it. it not going to flush. But in the end, we did catch a, a really good sample of birds, about 55 adults and 80 something chicks over those three years. Numbers in parentheses indicate the numbers of recaptures we had from birds uh, successive years.
where we did capture most birds was at the outlet of the lake, shown here in the, the green shaded circle. This is the outlet uh, shortly after arrival. You can see open water here and just this little trickle. This is the Mulchatna River in, uh, in May. And birds congregated among all this rubble, uh, mostly to feed on aquatic insects. That's surf birds, plovers, uh, tattlers, yellow legs. Uh, you could find almost a dozen species of, of waders here. Uh, feeding on aquatic insects. Russians, uh, they came with Russian ingenuity and what at the time are called luchok traps, which uh, is Russian for bow. So they were a bow trap, which we would set along the shores or on strategically on flat rocks that we would watch uh, surf birds continually walk over, they would walk through the traps and trip fine, fine threads, which you can't even see in this picture, triggering the trap. So that's how we caught them. By early, yeah, early to mid-June and through July, uh, that little trickle that was Mulchatton River becomes a rather uh, torrent and it becomes a favorite put in place for kayakers and whitewater rafters, which uh, go downstream from here about a kilometer and, and run into some class two, three and one stretch of class four rapids. So it changes uh, complexion uh, quite markedly in a, in a month's time once all that snow and glacial ice starts melting. So, you know, whether, whether we got all these birds color banded, uh, even we just could not find birds on the nesting areas during that incubation period. What saved us was uh, telemetry. Several of the birds we captured at the outlet of the lake, we put small radios on them and then scanned repeatedly from both study slopes to find them. They were very uh, pivotal in helping us find nests and later broods. What the telemetry revealed was that the non-incubating members of pairs were just weren't mostly were not on their nesting territories. They took off with other non-incubating members, formed these little groups or remained solitary, but they were, they were given that there's a bird on eggs and these other birds are gone, you could walk through an area and have no clue there were surf birds there. And that's what we faced early on. Uh, you know, this was that first year, uh, you come up on the bare terrace, you had to walk five kilometers to get to a nest. We got a few uh, young birds marked with radios and they were, uh, we could pin down their location gently where, you know, where they generally were, uh, but then you're still looking for this. Uh, What we had to rely on is behavioral cues, mostly of the adults, to find these. You know, once birds start to hatch, usually about 48 hours before the eggs uh, hatch, they star and the chicks inside are, are pretty vocal. You can hear them, or I used to be able to hear them. Uh, but the... Uh, the adult behavior, whether that's the, the stimulus for it or not, they go from these uh, birds that sit tight, uh, reluctant to move, silent. Uh, you can step right over them to uh, 
birds that begin alarming hundreds of meters before you get there. The closer you get to their nest or broods, the more vocal they get and to the point where you get within uh, 15, 20, 30 meters, the, they're flying right in your face. So that was the clue for us to sit down and try and find uh, chicks and watch the behavior of the adults who would uh, often go back on a nest or near it. Like I said, you could, you could use these behaviors to find both the nests uh, and the chicks. Uh, the adults and chicks are very vocal uh, between each other. They uh, needed brooding and the chicks would elicit a brooding call. The adults would answer and then you could just watch uh, an adult walk over to a certain area and out would pop the chicks to get brooded. And usually we waited till they got a, uh, good warming and then we would go over and capture the adults and the young. But you still had to do a lot of searching and uh, to find these things. Uh, often you, you swore you saw uh, a chick go into a, a bit of alpine tundra and you'd walk over and couldn't find it. I don't know if anybody has seen the two eggs down here. Obviously chick here but probably missed the chick right here with a pointer to an eye and the bill. It's still wet, just coming out of the egg. And that's its back, which looks like that tundra, that tundra, that tundra. Uh, extremely cryptic. Okay, to the, to the biology light part of the talk. Uh, what did we learn? We arrived before the birds and departed after many had left. So we filled in several missing data gaps uh, concerning breeding season chirology and seasonal events. Early and late snow melt, intermittent snowstorms after arrival and cool and wet conditions during hatch uh, probably contributed to most of the variation you see here among the three years. Uh, you know, tremendous ranges of, of egg laying. Uh, here, this is because in 1999, there was a major snowstorm that disrupted everything for about a week. Uh, I'm sure clutches were lost and birds relayed. You know, we can pretty much departed after uh, all these events had ceased, uh, except there was still fledging going on two of the years. This graphic depicts the location of nests and broods of surf birds when first found during the three years. Uh, nests and broods were mostly concentrated on the terraces with only a couple high on the ridges or down at sea level. Like there was a nest rather high up here one down here, we still can't explain that one. Uh, it was just very atypical. And we had one, everyone has a camp bird, we had ours. You know, in contrast to this, uh, Baird sandpipers nested much, much higher up here. They were attracted to snow fields, uh, retreating snow fields. Uh, Tattlers. There were a few nests here on the outwash gravel plain, which people think of as tattler habitat. Most of the nests occurred way off of this image to the left and way up in a series of things called Kettle Lake. So you can you can look all you want along the Mulchatin River for tattlers and you'd find them there. But all the nests were way inland, uh, four to five kilometers along little almost dried up lake beds. Again, if you want to know more about that, uh, that's out in those papers. Considering uh, the size of the area, most birds were faithful to nesting areas. Here we show the distance apart of pairs nesting in successive years. It's a small sample, 12, 12 pairs, but eight of the 12 uh, 
re-nested, nested in subsequent years within a kilometer of their previous nest. So again, given the size of the study area, we call this pretty high degree of fidelity. This, uh, I don't know if it's gonna make some flip remarks. Some, some football team has these colors, maybe it's the Denver Broncos, but uh, they just seem the two colors that went together best here. So uh, what this graph shows on the X axis is a 24 hour period starting at uh, 00, zero to 24, uh, successive days in June for three nests. So you have uh, one, two, three nests. Blue cells show hours that males incubated, orange when females incubated, and gray when uh, we had no information. You can see that both members of a pair uh, sometimes had incubation shifts of 24 or more hours. Uh, among monogamous shorebird species with biparental care, uh, it's, this is known for only one other species, and yes, it's the great knot part of that three bird clade. Uh, red knots uh, uh, deviate from the normal 12 on 12 off you see in most monogamous pairs. Uh, they've been found to have shifts of 15 to 20, 20 hours. So more similarity in that clade of birds. Here we show brood movements of uh, eight surf bird broods that were found at hatch or within a day of hatch. You can see some movements were very long over time, some remained short. Most were, were directed upslope. Uh, some as little as a, you know, 50 to 100 meters, uh, others several hundred meters. And most became associated with other broods uh, as the season went along, uh, we found several other broods that, at older ages, and those are not shown here, but there was this amalgamation of, of broods over time. Here I show uh, elapsed days that the broods were followed. Here's the broods. Uh, most of them were followed for over two weeks. And within those periods, these are the number of days we actually contacted the broods. Uh, so over a 20 day period in this one, we, we, we found the brood on nine different occasions. Here's the total distance the broods moved over that, uh, in this case, 20 days. Uh, here's one that moved seven and a half kilometers. Uh, granted, these could be, it's not straight line you know, they could be convoluted and come back on each other, but they're constantly being uh, moved around by the adults. What uh, was eye-opening to us was uh, things like this, where you have the, these are days since hatch. So essentially you have one of those little fluff balls I showed you earlier, less than a day old, uh, was walked uh, 540 meters uh, from its nest. Uh, here, two to three day old little fluff balls over a kilometer away, uh, they were taken. Uh, this is uh, this kind of is what, I mean, you would go to an area where you had seen the brood two or three days earlier and get no response from adults. Uh, initially thought uh, they'd lost uh, the brood, but then we would fan out and walk uh, different compass directions. And sure enough, there'd be adults alarming at us eventually. Turquoise Lake Tundra is, is rich in arthropods, which likely contributes to the rapid growth and movement capabilities of the chicks, like I just described. Uh, you know, this is mostly arm waving right now at this stage, but conditions are changing and uh, nowhere more rapidly than over Arctic montane habitats. So we produced uh, good baseline information here from which uh, you can assess change, but 
replicating even portions of the study uh, now falls to people much younger than I and in better shape and with uh, advances in, in remote sensing technology. So I think you can get uh, aspects of the study replicated to assess change over a 25 year period, but uh, a lot of it is just gonna be as I've described. So we filled in uh, under that no information category in the BNA, we filled in 24 of the 32 uh, sections that were labeled no information and we probably addressed twice that uh, uh, many other sections in the BNA count that uh, were wanting for information. So not so many secrets, but uh, like all investigations, uh, if, if questions have not arisen from your efforts, then probably haven't done a lot. Uh, in this case, uh, we have several things uh, that we would like to go back and look at, or somebody can. Uh, black lichens were critical to the location of uh, where nests were and the uh, microhabitat uh, where they were placed. I don't know if this is crypticity, microclimate because of the black and heat. Uh, be easy to look at. Uh, other thing, why 24 hour incubation shifts? Uh, why in this group of birds? What's driving it? You know, how, how can these little chicks, they're essentially like a cotton ball on a couple legs. How can they uh, move so far? And again, the function of amalgamating broods later on, you know, have, Predator protection, uh, information transferred. We found this in only one other uh, species and that's in the bristlethide curlew. What role does uh, the mouth of turquoise lake play as far as central place foraging? And there's a series of lakes that I showed you that all have these outfall lakes. Uh, I think it would be logical to do a GIS exercise in Alaska among the 10,000 plus glaciers, see if we can find a signature for this sort of habitat and just see uh, you know, how that relates to the distribution of surf birds. It's not unique to Turquoise Lake. Even though I question it here, we know we've been to the other two lakes adjacent and there are surf birds there. As I said, things are changing. Uh, you know, the glaciers that Turquoise Lake, uh, we watched a series of hanging glaciers uh, fall off the mountains the third year we were there. Uh, they're retreating, shrubification is occurring, what it's going to mean for surf birds and other montane nesting species, uh, I have no idea. A whole host of people were involved in this, but uh, principal for the staff of Lake Clark National Park and Preserve, especially uh, pilots, uh, uh, Fink and Allsworth, and then Shannon Kennedy Fink, uh, the logistics guru was there uh, 24 hours a day with a radio to console people when Hurricane winds came through, when bears came through the camp, resupply. Uh, Steve Cole, Fish and Wildlife Service, brought Pavel and Max uh, to the U.S. and uh, we found a place for him on this study, but then uh, subsequently for about six more years, we involved them in studies of uh, uh, the Park Service and inventorying montane nesting species. And lastly, uh, Alan Bennett, uh, he's the one who recognized, uh, he knew enough about surf birds to know that he had found a concentration of birds that probably warranted uh, an effort to, find, to study them. And I mentioned Max's artistic abilities. I close here with uh, just a bunch of his sketches that he managed to get done in his free time at Turquoise Lake uh, beyond 
my comprehension, but, uh, and uh, Laura, if you are watching this, uh, I, I'm sure Max would love to share some of this with you if you want a new uh, background for your Zoom uh, thing. So I'm going to wrap it up here and I will take questions if there are any. Bob, there are questions. There are actually quite a few. So um, those of you who still have questions, make sure you put them into the question and answer tab and um, we will make sure that we address them. And we have a few minutes to do that. So um, I'm gonna start with Benjamin Sonnenberg's question, which was, are there a few of these spectacular photos available in locations like the Macaulay Library? I'd love to review a few of the nesting chick photos. Well, I, I uh, gave attribution to all the photos. Uh, I, I, those, like the, the introductory photo to the talk was by Luke DeSico, and I'm pretty sure he posts his stuff to Macaulay. So you could look and, and see, uh, I've got three or four images from Luke that are just stellar, and I, I'm almost sure they're there. I haven't posted many, uh, but would be happy to or happy to share if there's one in particular you want. All right. Uh, we have a question from John Dunn. Um, it, it's actually several questions. Um, the first one is when you say non incubating birds travel far, how far do they travel? Well, they go across the uh, three to eight kilometers, if you want a number. They several crossed the lake to feed on the other slope along the shore. Most of them flew down to the outlet of the lake uh, from the head of the lake, that one nest, that was eight, eight kilometers. So they would make these daily foraging trips uh, when they weren't incubating. Uh, that was the pattern. We still had a couple nests where the non-incubating member stayed on the territory, but silent. Mm -hmm. Um, when do the juveniles leave? They, oh yeah, I could go back to that one graphic. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, in early July, all right. Fledging occurs, uh, you can see here in, in, mid-June to early July, and uh, we were gone before uh, there were still juveniles around when we left. We, we witnessed a lot of adult moves, especially females. They, uh, they blow out of there after about the first week attending chicks and dump everything in the male's lap, and uh, then they will get in these uh, loose aggregations of a uh, few males with lots of uh, juveniles and but we left before we saw the uh, last of the juveniles leave. Right. Uh, Paul Lehman asks, after leaving breeding grounds, do surfers stage at a few sites in Alaska in late summer or just trickle out? I think the latter, Paul. I don't, uh, I've been to Prince William Sound in uh, you know, in July and August, and yes, you'll find surfers there, but you do not get the concentrations like you do in, in, in spring on several of the islands there, uh, especially when herring are spawning and they're feeding on herring row. Uh, now you can, you can go to Kodiak, you can go to the south side of the peninsula and you'll find groups of a half a dozen so, but you do not get, at least I'm, I'm not aware of any place where they found big post-breeding staging concentrations. Um, can you sex the adults? We, uh, well, that was a part of the study I didn't, uh, didn't, didn't get into. Uh, they are sexually dimorphic. The females are bigger. Uh, they have significant longer wings, longer bills, longer tarsi. Uh, you can also at this time of year measure the, the breadth of the uh, cloaca, uh, in females, much bigger than males, and 
we we did a lot of uh, molecular sampling, took blood from the birds we captured. So a lot of the morphometrics are backed up with molecular data. Um, can you tell the difference between their arrival and departure dates for the males and the females? They both, uh, after that first year, we had mark known birds of known sex come back often within 24 hours of each other and and immediately reform pair bonds. Uh, we know that uh, just again from mark birds that the, the females are abandoning their broods uh, to the care of the males. Uh, so yes, we were pretty confident who was coming back at what time. Right. Um, Kimball Garrett would like to know any winter re-sightings or recoveries of your marked birds? Yes, uh, we had uh, in 1997, we'd marked that first cohort of birds and then we went to, uh, Pavel Max and I went to Prince William Sound in uh, first week of May, the last few days of April in 98 and found one of our birds there. And then six days later, found it again in uh, Turquoise Lake. Uh, We've had two other birds seen down off uh, Port Angeles, Washington, and uh, one down somewhere in Oregon. But uh, I would have expected to have seen more uh, based on the return rate. They're still making it through. So, you know, if you're hanging out on a high energy, uh, older shoreline along the Pacific, uh, it's not a place that a lot of people frequent. So. Uh, Resightings are probably low for that reason. All right. Um, Ed Harper would like to know how many instances of predation of nests did you observe? We observed a few. We watched one of our marked birds uh, be intercepted by a peregrine over the middle of the lake. Uh, but as terms of nests, uh, the main predator was uh, ground squirrels. Uh, foxes were there, but uh, we had two, I, I think two or three nests that we, we could tell just by the way the eggs were chewed, the ground squirrels had gotten them. But uh, overall, we didn't lose that many nests. So whatever their crypticity applies to predators as well as humans. Mm. Um, Lily would like to know, what made you choose Turquoise Lake for your study? Well, uh, my, my good friend, Alan Bennett, uh, you know, in Alaska, we have a shorebird group. Every year we have an annual meeting, and uh, I think I get on my soapbox and preach about, we don't know this about this, that, or the other. So Alan, working at uh, Lake Clark for the Park Service uh, and out doing birds at once he found what he thought was a, a workable population, he'd let me know. And that's, we went and there it was. Um, I'll do one more, um, another one from um, John Dunn. Um, has Pavel found a surf bird in Montaigne, Chukotla? Chukotka, no. sorry, I said that wrong. No, he is not. And he, believe me, he has looked. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's found black turnstones over there. Uh, you know, we get great knots coming to Nome all the time, uh, every spring. Uh, but no, uh, no nesting surf birds. That one picture I did show you of the uh, great knot surf bird and red knot was taken in Chukotka. Uh, so there, it, I'm not going to discount it uh, being part of the breeding range for sure. So that, that wraps up the questions. I'm going to get John back on. There we go. Take it away, John. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. That was an incredible presentation. Uh, boy, what a place to work. Um, it makes my knees sore looking at you guys up there on those slopes. Um, I thank you everyone for attending and I hope we'll all join me in offering uh, Bob a virtual ovation.
And we'll be taking a short break. Uh, our next program is the first science session of the conference, and that'll be at 1230. So I hope to see all of you there and um, thank you very much. <laughs>